The Annika Thomas Show. Hello and welcome to the Annika Thomas Show. Thank you for joining me today. The person who is joining me today is not my normal co-host, Renee Couture, but somebody I partner with often, and it is my husband, Mr. Rick Thomas. Rick, thank you for doing this with me. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're in the middle of a series, and I'm interested to to hear from you today, Rick. I'm just going to give you the mic an awful lot, um, but to just kind of... Um, back up and talk about what we've been talking about in the show is a, a an acronym for the word Christian. You and I like acronyms. We made an acronym of our last name to help our kids learn who they were right. as a member of the Thomas family. You want to talk about that? Um, well, I wanted to find different characteristics that fit our family. And so we broke down our, our last name, Thomas, and we had a letter. Uh, we had a word for each letter that was a characteristic that fit our family. And all of our kids were given the assignment to, you know, pick some. And then we brought them all together. And a lot of them, we chose the same things. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty awesome. And we, we all, as a team, decided on what for each letter. Yeah. And, and then we took the words that we chose that represented each letter. And we found a verse in the Bible that um, had that word mm -hmm. in it. So it gave it even more meaning. And then we printed up those sheets and we, um, you know, each child has a copy of it and we hang them up around the house to remind them who they are. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, a good thing for uh, a child to know who they are and, and what they believe. And it's a, certainly a good thing for a Christian to know what does it mean to be a follower of Christ. It's not something we are to take lightly. And um, that's what we've been talking about the last few weeks on our show. We've talked about C, child of God, which, of course, is an interchangeable term with the word Christian. As a Christian, we are a child of God. Uh, H for holiness and how God makes us holy. And because of that, out of response to him, we can live a holy life. Uh, I had uh, my mother on with me for the R show. We covered the respect from a lot of different angles. Last week, Renee and I talked about I being I am, which is a very powerful name of God. And then we also talked about how the fact that I am who God says I am. And, um, you know, he says that we are loved, we're forgiven, safe, accepted, and the list goes on and on. And that is part of our identity. Also part of our identity is what we're going to talk about this week and next week. And Rick is going to be with me for both of those shows. And S being student and T being teacher. And they go hand in hand, obviously, but um, the the fact of the matter is, is being a student of God and being a teacher of God is all part of discipleship. So this is kind of a two-part uh, mini-series inside the series with S&T on discipleship, um, because that's what God has, has called us to be. He had his 12 disciples when he walked the earth, and now we have the honor of being his disciple. So Rick, just to jump in here, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? Well, you know, it was pretty cool because I, I read a verse recently, and I forget which of the Gospels it was in, but it was talking about how Jesus chose the 12. He had disciples, and he went off and he prayed throughout the night. He prayed throughout the night. So everybody's sleeping. He's praying throughout the night. And he came back, and he chose the 12. Mm. And um, so, It's you like know, the scripture what, that Jesus said, he doesn't do anything that he doesn't know from the Father. Yeah. What, I, what my Father sees, I do. That's right. So, you know, when I think about uh, being a student of Christ and being a, a disciple of Christ, it's often interchangeable with even like a bond servant that when I think about a disciple, it's one who has left his ambitions to follow Christ. Because mm -hmm. when it, Jesus it, went up to these to Peter and John, they were fishermen, yeah. and they left their boats and went on the road with this man. They, they felt drawn to him, and their lives were completely changed. Matthew, the tax collector. Yes. Okay. Let's, and, and, and well, were those people that were in their lives before still there? They were. They went and they ate dinner with them, and of course, you know, um, teachers of the law, past judgment on them and so forth. But when I think about being a disciple, I think about how I came to Christ. And, you know, the associate pastor at, at that church, um, he gave me a New Testament. And I remember going back to my apartment and I was, uh, my roommates were asleep. And I remember staying up throughout the night reading and I would read slowly and I'd really want to get it all in and to understand who God was. And 
how am I going to explain this to others? I'm going to tell them about this very charismatic supernatural experience that happened to me. They're, this doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to me, mm-hmm. you know, but it woke me up. He shook me and he woke me. And, um, and that's how I see it. So I get in the word and I study and I study and I study. Now, while I'm in the word and spending time with him, you know, the, the, the sin that so easily besets us, you know, as Paul would word it, just certain things just went away where I just had no, des- I had no desire to do it. Didn't even realize I hadn't done it. You know, like I, I chewed tobacco and, and it had been a couple of weeks and I used to, I would always have chew in my mouth or something, you know, and, and I realized, Hey, I haven't, haven't had to chew. That's weird. Well, that I guess really, I don't need that anymore. That really underscores how we really are new creatures, brand new creations once we come into a relationship with God. But sometimes there are some sins that we have to work on. They don't automatically always go away. Sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. That's true. And, and especially, you know, I think when, when we walk in doubt, when we get out of the word of God, when we start listening to other voices in the world, you can be drawn away. Mm -hmm. And, And I can see how that can be easily done, especially, you know, you know, Peter going out, walking on the water, um, I guess it was Jesus's will for him to walk on it because he said, sure, come on out. And then Peter gets out and he gets his eyes off Jesus and he starts to fall and realizes, whoa, this mm-hmm. is beyond me. Well, there's so and, many different influences and we have to be aware of who is teaching us. Who are we allowing to influence us? So we've got to have a big, heavy filter so that we aren't tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Yes. And, and I mean, that's the beauty of God's word. And and I've got some different verses here, and, and I just wanted to, you know, um, cover some of these. So like Hebrews 4.12, mm-hmm. it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is from God's is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. Now, the beauty of this, it shows us that God is our most open relationship, our most honest and trustworthy relationship we'll ever have, because he knows every detail about us. Yeah, we can't hide there's, anything. There's there's nothing hidden. He knows that, and he still calls us. Yes. You know, and that was, whoa, whoa, <laughs> wait. So, uh, you know, it While reminds- you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't anything that we did. And so it's amazing that that God, the great teacher himself, we have direct access to. Yeah, it, and, and it's kind of like that verse in Isaiah where Isaiah has this vision and, um, and the Lord's speaking to him. And Isaiah had already been prophesying. He was already a prophet. And the Lord's speaking to him, though, and he says, um, who, you know, who, will, who will go? Who will I send? Mm-hmm. And Isaiah says, well, um, I'm a man of unclean lips. You've already been prophesying. You've already, of course, I'm going to send you. Isaiah, do you see anyone else standing here? You know, (laughs) and and uh, this angel, he takes this piece of coal and he sticks it to Isaiah's lips. And I have no idea what the real significance of that is, except confirmation. Yeah, Isaiah, don't you think I know what I'm doing? God met him where he was at. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you recognize you're a man of unclean lips. We're going to work on that, (laughs) but I've called you. I still want to use to do this. So then, after that, when the Lord says again, who will go? Who will I send? Isaiah jumps to it and says, here am I. Send me. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, it's, it's awesome because then, you know, you read verses like Daniel 2. And out of all the guys in the Bible, there's only a, a few that there's like nothing negative said about them. Like there's nothing talking about, you know, any sin. Like Joseph, he was a man who totally honorable life had some horrible stuff happen, and God used it for his glory. Daniel, same thing. God used these things to exalt his name um, there in Babylon. Mm -hmm. So Daniel 9.2, it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet. So that means Daniel was in the word. Yes. He wasn't just, hey, okay, I'm a captive here in Babylon. I'm going to be loyal to the Lord no matter what. And, and I mean, was he doing it to seek position or power or authority? Did he want to rule over anybody? No, he just wanted to serve God. And he's in the word and he sees, hey, okay, well, Jeremiah actually prophesied about this. So he knew that the desolation of Jerusalem would only last 70 years. 
So he turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I mean, he got he, he got serious. It not only did the word tell him what was going on, uh-huh. his present and the future, it it also showed him how he should pray, mm-hmm. and not just you know walking about about your day, seeing how things are. You can pray about how things are in the world, but seeing the word. I mean, especially when you see you know the end times as as we're coming to. You know, people seeking after teachers that will tickle their ears and just tell them what they want to hear. That's not how God wants us to learn. So um, we'll cover that later. So how, uh, does, how do we learn? What are our sources for learning what we need to learn? You've talked about the Bible. Yeah, well, one, God's given everyone a conscience. And conscience means with knowledge. Mm-hmm. So in Romans, it, it speaks about that everyone has a knowledge of God. So you, you mean an atheist or an agnostic? I don't believe you <laughs> because you have knowledge of God just in nature and creation, creation alone. Yeah. Our DNA is like a book. Uh-huh. Does a book just appear out of nowhere? No, uh-huh. someone wrote the book yeah. and it was God. So we have a conscience. And then when we come to Christ, Christ gives us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. And Let then, me say something about conscience before sure. you move too quickly. Uh, the Bible speaks about how your conscience can be seared. I believe that we know what is right and what is wrong, but with compromise and with um, listening to the wrong sources, the, the, any number of ways, it can be seared. And then you get confused and you don't have that great sense of right and wrong, and your conscience isn't really telling you, stop, don't do this, because you've justified it, because your conscience is seared. I, and, you know, all three of these work together, our conscience, and the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. They all work together. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus rebuked religious leaders, and he said, you do error in not knowing the Scriptures. Now, these guys prided themselves in knowing the Scriptures. They had put the Scriptures in little boxes and tied them to their foreheads. I mean, they prided themselves. They wanted everyone to know that, hey, I know the Word. And yet, he says, you study the Scriptures, but they testify of me but you refused to come to me to have life. Mm. So they had the word, but I, why they didn't receive Christ as the Messiah when the, when the scriptures testified of him? The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So when we read the Bible, we'll see God's plan from the beginning and how it's all written together to show us who we are and what his will is for our lives. It's an amazing story that we have the opportunity to share with others. You're listening to the Annika Thomas Show on Talk Radio 1170 KFAQ with Rick and Annika Thomas. Rick, we're talking about being a student of the Word, being a student of uh, the Holy Spirit, God Himself, and we are discussing this concept of of discipleship, of learning and growing in Christ and sharing what we have with others, and uh, you're on with me next week too, but being a student is something that you've experienced um, recently here in your, your 40s. Uh, that's right. Yeah, I, I started uh, my new job at Tedford Insurance and uh, I'm going to be selling home and auto insurance. And there's a lot of studying, a lot of companies. They represent over 100 companies. So there's a lot of different underwriting policies for each of these companies. And I'm just studying everything to try to be the best that I can. And it's really awesome because it ties into being a student of the Word because are we studying the Bible uh, just to. I mean, are are we following God just to make it into heaven? Mm-hmm. I mean, hey, we may smell like hell, but at least we're here, you know. I mean, or or did we did we follow God with all of our hearts and all of our soul and all of our mind? Did we love Him that much to say, "All right, Lord, do with me as you will"? As Isaiah said, "Here am I, send me." And so I, I looked at the the power of the Word of God, and there's there's different uh, verses about that. We talked about the Word of God being a double double edged sword. And we talked about Daniel studying um, the scriptures and, and knowing what 
time he was living in, according to what Jeremiah had prophesied. Mm -hmm. And now Romans 15. And we talked about Jesus rebuking the religious leaders because um, they knew they said they know the scriptures, but the scriptures testified it testif testified of Jesus. And then Romans fifteen four it says, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they they provide, we might have hope. Mm -hmm. So all the all the stories of the Old Testament, you know, Jerem, um, Joseph being thrown into the well. Uh, the children of the Hebrews walking through the wilderness for 40 years. All those stories are given as examples to us. And we learn not only by good examples, but we learn by bad examples too. And there's some really great ones that that, uh, Tim, that Paul gives uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy later. But another verse in 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God wants to equip us. How does he do it? He gives us his word. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us a conscience so we can follow him as he's called us to, and he's equipped us to do it so that we don't have to be swept away by every wind of doctrine. We can do as the Bereans did. And I love this, uh, Bereans Acts 17, 11, says when Paul left uh, Thessalonica, he went into Berea. They preached the gospel there. And it said the Berean Jews were more were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and Greek men. So they didn't just take Paul's word for it. Now they were excited about it. Hey, this is making sense to me because sure they had they had a certain knowledge of the scripture. So when he would when he would uh, show them Jesus through the prophets and through the law, he would he would show them Jesus, and they would say, "Whoa, we're gonna we're gonna examine these scriptures." And he said they did it every day. So it wasn't just, "Hey, I'm gonna hear it." Oh yeah, this message tickles my ears. So oh, that's great. No, they actually examined the scriptures to find out is he saying what's mm -hmm. really in the Word of God, or is this just some man-made doctrine? Mm -hmm. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul gives Timothy a warning. He says, Instead, oh, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. He had instructed Timothy how he should teach, but he says there's going to be a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth, and turn aside to myths, but you keep your head in all situations. I love that translation. Keep your head, keep your head, son, and endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And then he talks about, hey, you know, I'm about to get out of here. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, with the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now, the sign of a, of a great disciple is one that takes that crown. Yes, we will receive a crown, but the reason we want that crown is to be able to lay it at the feet of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Revelations, it talks about um, the elders, they're laying their crown at the feet of Jesus. So we think of these heavenly rewards and I just think of this crown. I think it's, here you go, Jesus. Mm. This, this is, here's, here's the crown. I had the and honor of doing all I, these things for it you. It was an honor. And, I mean, when you think of Paul being beat, being betrayed, being thrown in prison, being left for dead. I mean, you think of Paul, does he sound like a man of faith of today? You know, <laughs> I mean, you, if, if you were to ask someone on the street, hey, name, uh, give me, the name of a man of faith, they'd probably try to give you some name off of TV, you know. They'd be like, oh, you know, here's this name. And someone being beat and thrown in prison and stuff, they're most likely not even known. I doubt Paul realized at the time that God was using him to write two-thirds of the New Testament, that God took even that situation and turned it for something good because it gave him that extra time to do this. 
Well, we have the luxury of um, speaking more next week, and I'm so glad that you'll be with me on next week's show. But one other point that I want to underscore before we run out of time is it's one thing to learn and absorb the right information, but it's not very good, not very worthwhile if you don't apply that knowledge that you have received from God from his word, from his spirit, from your conscience, to know what to do and to not do it, isn't that a definition of sin itself? Yeah, to, to know to do good and, and to do it not is sin, yeah. So there's some happy, encouraging words <laughs> at the end. Well, no, here's, here's you know, I didn't, I didn't discuss the Holy Spirit, but here's um, Jesus in John 14, 26. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you, I'm leaving you at peace. I'm giving you my own peace. I'm not giving it to you as the world gives. So don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. You have heard me tell you I'm going away, but I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. I've told you this now before I leave so that when I do leave, you will believe. And as Christians, we have the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had when he walked the earth. And God himself is with us. Uh, And it's just a matter of receiving from him and living in connection to him is is having our receivers up and having our desire to be always connected to God and what he's doing. What is he involved in? And how can I get in step with getting included in what God is at work doing in the earth and in the people in my life and in the the things I'm involved in and how can I represent God. Jesus told us to teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. It's in Matthew 28. It's the uh, some of his last words, go and make disciples. So we'll continue this discussion next week uh, with Rick Thomas on the Annika Thomas Show. Thanks for joining us this week and just want to encourage you to get to know God. He is good. He is for you. He is with you. And he wants to be as close to you as um, the thoughts in your head. I was going to say butter on toast. That's good, too. Come, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Who shall I fear? You crush the enemy.